Good afternoon. Today is May 3rd, 2004 at Chaminade High School, Mineola, New York. We are happy to have here today Peter Korchi Kayara, Jr., U.S. Army. Uh, the interviewers are Joseph Gambino and Daniel Moulton. The cameraman is Daniel Macaron. Now, Peter, I understand that you were drafted into the Army, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Uh, did you have any feelings of how, which uh, re uh, division you were drafted in, whether it be U.S. Army, U.S. Navy? Well, at that time you weren't drafted into the Navy, you were drafted into the Army. Navy was volunteer, as was the Air Force and Marines. Okay, and uh, how were you feeling once you were drafted? It was my duty to serve, and I so felt I had to go serve. Okay. Um, what was your rank in the Army? Uh, you go in as a private, and I came out as a specialist fourth class. Um, your unit was placed in Korea, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. How were your feelings once you entered Korea and you saw what was going on? Well, it was kind of strange, because I was going into a foreign country like that. I wasn't used to seeing the type of living conditions that they were living under. The, the thing that struck me most as soon as I landed was the, the odor. Because they did have, have a lot of rice patties in Korea, and they, the type of fertilizer they used really put, put off a real bad odor. Would the U.S. Army eat the, eat the rice patties for nourishment as well? Would they have their own food? No, they had their own food. The same, and same with the water. You weren't allowed to drink the water. You had to use Lister bags for water. I don't know. What was your basic water. training in Korea? Excuse me? What was your basic training in Korea? You no, know, my basic training was in Fort Dix, New Jersey, prior to going to a single school in Fort Gordon, Georgia. And uh, once I left Fort Gordon, Georgia, I was assigned to Fort Leavenworth. There we, uh, in the communication center, was the Midwest Relay Station. Uh, Midwest Relay Station was one of three major communication centers for the United States Army. Uh, one was in Fort Detrick, Maryland, one was in Camp Davis, California, and Midwest Relay Station was in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. From there, I was assigned to Korea. In September of 64, I arrived in Korea. And ultimately, I was discharged and from there, September 65. It says you were a teletype operator. That's correct. Um, can you share with us any experiences of sometimes when you... Well, we handled uh, a lot of classified information. They had cryptographic uh, equipment that we had to change the coding on every day. Uh, this was to enable uh, secure transmissions of messages. Now we were responsible for the entire 7th Infantry Division message center and we would have to make sure that any messages that were of a uh, classified nature would get to the proper authorities at the right time and in a quick, in a quick fashion or manner. Because of your expertise, what was your opinion of the American Code during the Cold War? It was, it was new to me, so I, I had, really had no opinion of it. I just felt, oh, this is, this is nice. You know, it's not allowing enemies to enter into your transmissions, which I'm sure they were breaking the codes left and right. How did that feel to know that you had classified information that you were transmitting? Uh, it, not no problem with it because I was at a security clearance at my old job prior to going into the Army. So I was handling classified information there also. Uh, did you have any combat service? No, not, none at all. Uh, when were you first under fire? Uh, we were actually never under fire. We were always a threat of uh, being under fire, but we never were. Mm -hmm. And what were your feelings in combat? I was nervous, scared. Uh, did you receive any injuries, wounds, or illnesses? No, not at all. Uh, were you captured? Not at all. Um, what was your old job that you spoke of before? Okay, I was a, I was a technical editor at Coles and Instrument Corporation. We were working in the publications department. We would uh, write technical manuals on the equipment that we sold to the Air Force, Army, Navy, and I just had to do the technical edit to make sure it was technically accurate before I left the building. Did you feel that that helped you before going to the Army as a teletype operator? No, not too much. Uh, what was daily life like? Did your equipment work well? How was it compared to the enemies? Yeah, the teletype equipment uh, worked very well. Uh, I don't know what the enemy was using, so I, I can't answer that. 
However, well, our equipment was constantly had uh, preventive maintenance uh, done on it to make sure that it was operating properly. And if there was a problem, we'd call the repairman in. Right. Uh, what was your unit or ship like? And how were your officers? Uh, the unit was uh, you know, pretty cohesive, which was a surprise to me. Everybody got along fairly well. It's difficult when you have a bunch of people from different walks of life getting together and living in the same quarters. However, uh, we managed to, to get by. You know, we had, we had the little arguments and skirmishes, and you know, your people break them up. Uh, the officers, the officer I had, the captain of the company, was uh, not your typical army officer. He didn't really uh, very stringent. We're not very stringent with the rules. He allowed to bend the rules here or there, whereas other company commanders wouldn't. They weren't by the letter of the law. They wouldn't allow you to do certain things that uh, were so to speak, against its army regulation. Um, it says that you received a marksman's medal. Can you tell us about that? Yes, in basic training, you're rated on your, uh, your shooting ability. They train you with a rifle. They teach you how to, how to use it, how to clean it, how to take care of it. And uh, you have to take target practice. After a certain amount of target practice, they, they give you a test, and you, you, you get certain levels. You have marksman, you have uh, uh, sharpshooter, and you have expert. Well, uh, once you were in Korea, what was the communication like with back home? It's strictly uh, mostly letters. Well, uh, just once I was able to call. Were you longing to do more of that yes, every absolutely. day? Absolutely. Um, did you adapt to the environment, I mean, like culture in Korea? What yes, was it I like? did. And we were able to. Uh, Go into the villages. There's a village outside of uh, the, the camp. We were out on pass. It was a curfew. We had to be back by midnight. However, we, you know, we got to walk around, talk to some of the people. Some of them spoke a little English. Uh, you try to learn whatever Korean you can. I looked up a few words, and today I still speak some of the words. I have Korean neighbors that I speak to. Uh, I, you know, we're not. I wouldn't say uh, I, I can hold it complete conversation, but I can say a few words so they understand what I'm saying. What was your opinion of how the South Koreans uh, accepted the U.S. forces? Um, they, they loved the U.S. forces. In fact, we had some uh, Republic of Korea Army personnel, they called ROCA, ROCA personnel, training with us and sort of working side by side with us. And we were teaching them some of the military tactics that we used. Did they grasp it quickly? Pretty much, yeah, pretty much. See, the thing with the Republic of Korean Army people, if your father was a president of the country, you went into service for four years, no matter what. And there's no exemptions whatsoever other than if you were handicapped. So you couldn't get by because you're a college student, because you're, you, you, you have your father with two kids, you had to serve your country. Did you feel like these members of Roko were your brothers in some aspects, fighting against the North Koreans? Well, we didn't really fight against the North Koreans. But we were just, like I say, teaching them how to be tactical and tactical in certain situations. And how to survive in the event that they did, did have a combat situation. Was there ever times that the South Koreans showed any hostility to the Americans? Not, not while I was there, no. Uh, what persons, uh, what people do you remember best from the service, and why? I remember my the one fellow, C. R. Miller. C. R. was a, uh, a fellow from from the south. He was very, uh, he was a loner basically, and I just started talking to him, and we became pretty good friends. Uh, he had a rough life, and this is the reason why he was in the army. He was either in the army or go to jail, one or the other. He gave him a choice. So uh, we were pretty friendly. We, we just hung out together a lot. You know, we, we do a lot of things together. We go to the NCO clubs and things like that. Eventually, he got sent out to France, and uh, I have never heard from him since. He wasn't the type of person to keep in communications with anybody. Um, you mentioned how you know, you were on either spending time with him in jail or on the service. What did you mean by that? Well, he. Made a mistake when he was a young fellow, and they uh, 
you committed a crime, and the judge be, gave him a choice. Either you go to prison or you join the army. So he joined the army. Uh, did you get to spend any time on leave? Yes, we, uh, in fact, they had a, uh, a retreat house called Walker Hill in Korea. Um, what experiences left the greatest impressions on you? Excuse me? What experiences left the greatest impressions on you? Yeah, there was quite a few experiences. But I, just was, uh, I guess one of the episodes we had outside of camp one day, we had a call and to get uh, get a, a group together, a group of uh, people together to go out into the fields. And there was a story of a, a, a communique coming in that there was a, a person from North Korea had got by checkpoints and uh, they wanted us to go scour the hills for him to see if we could find him. And we were told he was wounded. So we all went, we went out there on patrol. And uh, one of the, there was a lot of the Korean people, they gather wood and stuff for their fires and things like that. And one of the women told one of the Roka soldiers who was with us that he was a, what they called, they called them slicky boys. These guys would come in, steal stuff out of your carpool or motor pool and take it back up north. And they told us he was the chief of the slicky boys. He was in charge of them. So we, we captured him and when we, uh, we went to search him, his guts were hanging out and being shot. So we called the MPs, they took him to the hospital. What happened from there, they didn't let us know. And we asked a couple of times, he says, it's not our business. Said, I guess intelligence took care of it. Uh, well, you were in Korea, what was your uh, take on the lifestyle that these people had compared to? Well, they were very, very poor people. Their annual income was maybe $500 a year at the time. Uh, most of the people, uh, in the villages, either they worked for the government, the United States government, in the PXs and in the uh, the bathhouses, the uh, uh, burger shops, things like that. You know. And a lot of them just lived and existed because of the United States Army being there. Because they would spend money, soldiers would spend money in the, uh, in the towns. They'd go and buy food, they'd go and buy beer, they'd go to the clubs. It was 19 bars in a village maybe as big as this walk out here. Did you feel, you felt compassion, obviously, for the South Koreans? Oh, yeah, right? I, felt so. I, I felt sorry. Some of the soldiers didn't, some of the soldiers took advantage of them, which I didn't think was right. In what respects? Well, I mean, they would abuse them. They would teach, treat, treat them like they were dirt, or, well, uh, you know, subhuman. But that wasn't the way to be. It's not um, the way to treat people. What was the relationship like between Korea and Vietnam at the time? Well, at the time, uh, Vietnam was escalating, and we were put on alert. Uh, because of that escalation, we had to set up a, uh, a forward communications van. And we were out in the field for 40 days wondering whether North Korea was going to come over the DMZ. We were about 25 miles south of the DMZ. How was that tension there? Did you ever feel like, well, we can actually be well, invaded we were, any day? We were very nervous, and we had a couple. Of, I had one incident where I almost shot my lieutenant because he snuck up on me, and I was on guard duty. Excuse me, I was on guard duty, and we were guarding the communication van, and he decided to sneak up on me, and I wheeled around with my 45 in his face, and I screamed at him. I told him, "Don't ever come in this area again," because he didn't have a security clearance. He didn't belong there. He was, had every right to check up on us, yes, but he wasn't supposed to be in that area. How did he take it? He was nervous. I, think. I, I told him, I said, when you come into this area, I said, there's a sign there that says, authorized personnel only. I said, you told that sign and you call me. So when I went into the van to relieve CR, who was in the van, he came out and he knocked on the van door and he came in and told me, he says, the lieutenant was there by the sign, towing the sign, going, psst, psst, calling me. So he learns his lesson not to uh, venture into unauthorized territory. Uh, do you feel there could have been an invasion in 1964? Absolutely. There's, there's uh, a lot of rumors going around that uh, they were uh, ramping up up in North Korea. They were ready to make a, a charge to come down and cross into the south again. And so we, you know, we were setting up communications. We were nervous because we're 
we went, we went to first line of defense, we had the infantry for that. However, we were still nervous that we would have to uh, uh, fight our way out of that. Do you feel you were in a mental state to take on this invasion if it came? Yes, you, you, you have to be. You have no choice. You've got to be prepared mentally. If you're not prepared mentally, you're in trouble. You mentioned earlier about uh, an indigenous person breaking through security checks. Do you think there could have been better security? Or would that happen in any place? I wasn't familiar with what the security regulations and what the security setups were there. Uh, apparently, if someone can get through, they had to be beefed up. Um, what would you do for fun in South Korea if you had any at all during this day? Well, we had we had fun to leave. We'd go down to the town, the bars, and we would dance with the girls. There was a lot of girls in the bars. We would dance with them, you know, a couple of beers. And Make sure we're back by midnight. At that time, at that time, were you married currently? No. Uh, what was the common talk in Korea that you used? Common talk? No, we just most of the times the guys would be talking and the girls would just be sitting there listening, trying to understand what we're saying. Um, how would you celebrate the holidays in your military life? Well, we celebrate New Year's up at the NCO club. Having beers and that's it, and we celebrated that way. We learned what to do. Did you have any favorite food preferences while you were in Korea? No. Just whatever, Just whatever they, they gave you. Whatever they gave us. Um, after the war, when you returned home, uh, what did you go back to? Your regular job? I went back to my regular job. Yeah. They had a thing. There was a law in the books that they had to give you your job back when you went back, so I don't know about that. Um, you actually have a picture of yourself uh, yes, while you were in the communication center. Can you see that? Yeah, a picture of me when I got out of signal school in Fort Gordon, Georgia. Okay. The orange scarf signifies signal ball, as does the lapel pins. This here, metal here, is, is, is the marksman metal I spoke to you earlier about. Um, did you remain in contact with any of your war buddies as as you returned back to America? No, I was from all different parts of the country. We never really kept contact. I, really was, I, I knew one fellow that I stopped over and seen him in Jersey a couple of times. But he uh, went and never kept in contact with me after that. Did you form any really close bonds while you were in Korea with? Someone other than that captain that you spoke of earlier? No. It was normally a tight knit group. It was a tight knit group, but everybody went their own way once they got discharged. How were your living conditions while you were in Korea? We, were, we lived in Quonset, what they call Quonset huts. And they, uh, I'm sure you've seen them. They're like little field houses, you see them. Uh, they slept, I think, 12 in a barracks. They had 12, 12 bunks. A little pot that we stole in the uh, How did you feel about Vietnam? Well, I, I was I was wondering why. We, 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 I understood why we were able to help those people, but to, to get further involved was uh, something I, I couldn't understand. We thought what was going on in relation to the protests of the war in Vietnam. If you had been aside to go to Vietnam, do you think you would still have gone to serve your country? Absolutely. And what would your attitude be to those who protest the war in America? I would not be very happy about those people not supporting the troops. Obviously there has to be some support, otherwise they can't do their job and the country would fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, once you returned home to America after your job, what next happened in your life? Well, I met my dear wife. We got married. We bought a house out in Hicksville. Moved out there. And I continued working where I was until they moved out of state. And then I went to my own business. I was in, in five gas stations, two of which are here in Mineola. And when I sold those, I went to work for a company out in Bohemia, New York, called Dayton T. Brown. And there I'm working in the technical publications area as a program manager. What was your opinion of the president's decision to move into Vietnam? I was 
wasn't uh, I, I wasn't really opinionated at that time. I felt that the troops got to go. They have to go. That's you know that's the way we would know it. You didn't feel it was necessary or unnecessary based on. I didn't know position. too much about it. I didn't read too much about it. Uh, today, are you a member of any veteran leagues? Or any no, I'm not in any uh, veteran association like VFW or American Legion. No, I don't belong to any of those. Would you go and visit any memorials today on the past war, such as the Vietnam War? I have done that, yes. How, do that, how does that make you feel? Sad. Very sad. You obviously knew a lot of people that are uh, listening. I didn't know anybody personally, but I knew people who've known people that uh, were killed. You know, my wife's uh, dear friend was killed when we went to see his name on the wall down in Washington. Do you feel that back then there was another, any other places that the U.S. presence was needed in the Asian area that you might want to have volunteered to go to? Um, I, I wouldn't volunteer. And why is that? So, so if they would send me, I would go. I wouldn't volunteer. Well, thank you, Peter, for sharing your You're life welcome. experiences with us. This is the very uh, learning experience for all of us, and we can all benefit from this. Thank you. By the way, I believe I mispronounced your name earlier. Um, can you please recite it for us for the sake of the documentary? Yeah, my name is Peter C.O.C.R. Thank you very much. You're welcome.